Hey, what's up? Joel Evan here, host of the Hack Life Podcast and weight loss coach for busy men. I'm excited to tell you I just dropped an eight-week program dedicated to motivated and busy men who want to lose weight. Let's face it, guys. When you lose weight, you feel more confident and you have higher self-esteem and you go out and you crush the world. You crush your goals and you start living your higher purpose. So if you're interested, DM me at Joel Evan Coaching or email me below, info at joelevancoaching.com. All right, hey, it's Joel from The Hack Life, and I'm here with my good friend, Ian Mitchell, the founder of Carbon 360. C360. C360. Sorry, there's been so many name changes recently. There, there, it's, <laughs> it's thrown me off from Thrive 360. To, anyways, I just call it, I call it Carbon 60, but your specific brand is... Yeah, C360 Health was the company. C360 Health, thank you. And uh, biocharge.co, mm-hmm. which can't wait to get... To, talk about that today yeah it's pretty epic stuff actually i'm very very jazzed about it welcome to the show thanks man and thanks for being able to do this on a on a helicopter that we're <laughs> with our helicopter uh pilot with our headsets, uh, headsets yeah, that we're, we go. we're rocking with um so much to talk about uh, we could go anywhere in this conversation but just to kind of start it off um i thought it'd be cool to kind of let the audience know your background and like what is your background <laughs> what are you by the way <laughs> So uh, it's it's pretty varied. I mean, you know, we're friends, so we've talked, and you kind of know the the whole gist. But yeah, it's really very varied. So I studied chemistry, I studied music, um, I've done a lot of things: architecture, you know, real estate development, uh, biochemistry, chemistry, physics, lots of things. I'm just probably overly curious, and I ask a lot of questions. And then, as fate would have it, luckily I seem to have pretty good retention of things. So I consume a ridiculous amount of information and then just uh, try and synthesize it and and seemingly am pretty good at picking up patterns that have been missed before. And so I just synthesize a lot of data and and put it together in ways that as of late, um, I've been just trying to help, you know, help people and heal things. And so, you know, it's one of the big projects I've been working on recently was Biocharged and that was you know, an ozonated oil product, and then another was uh, carbon-negative concrete, and two seemingly very disparate fields, but the goal of both is to help, right? You know, it's, uh, when I opened my lab eight years ago, I jotted down six things on the board that's literally been on the top right corner of the board ever since, Um, because then I figure I'll, I'll take them off or draw a line through them when I actually crack all of those puzzles, but I wanted to solve those six things before I died. And those are kind of, they're still my goals, right? So that's what I'm doing is slowly ratcheting those things off. And what's funny is I just kind of stream of consciousness wrote them on the board and as fate would have it, uh, it sure seems like in order to get to the next one, you have to make serious progress on the first one. Like the first one was aging. Yeah. And so, which is why I started working on carbon 60 back in the day. So it's, um, I had lost a, uh, a very large chunk of change when the, uh, the economy kind of crashed in 2008 and the subprime market imploded because I was very leveraged in a lot of real estate. And so I was looking at my retirement portfolio at the time thinking, oh my God, I'm going to have to like slave away forever. And so I ran out the numbers to like 70 years and it, it was not so hot. And I was like, oh God, this sucks. And so then I ran it out to 90 years and I was like, well, that's pretty nice. And then for grins, because I'm kind of a math nerd, I ran it out to 110. And at 110, I was like, oh, oh, oh that's that's quite the pleasant retirement. I can travel all over the world and do cool stuff and just like enjoy the planet. And so I thought, well, 110 means I'd probably need to live to be like 130 in flawless health. I'm oddly tooled to crack that egg. So I'm going to do that. So that, yeah. So and literally, so then I started working on you know, human longevity and making some pretty big strides. And at the time, you know, to look at the, the carbon 60 thing, it had been discovered by three guys in 1985 and they all got a Nobel prize for it. And one of the, one of the fellows is a, is a friend of mine and really genuinely great chemist. And, um, they made real strides with it, but people thought that it was going to be, because it's, you know, structured in the way it is, that it'd be used for maybe drug delivery in in people or something like that. Nobody really thought that it was going to be something that was a a product where people would actually ingest it. But then a research group started lipolizing it, just combining it with lipids, and that allows it to move into the cell membrane, because otherwise it's hydrophobic, so you can't get it to bond to water. Mm. And once you lipolize it, you can actually ingest it, and it'll move through a cell membrane. So... A research group uh, headed up by this fellow, Fathi Musa, 
was doing this experiment to figure out the LD50, which is the lethal dosing, like how much of a substance kills 50% of the population of the animals and try and, you know, and that's, that's a standard practice to just assess how toxic is something. Yeah. And so in this case, what they found was rather than kill the animals, it extended their lifespan 90%. And I saw that study when it came out even though they went over the threshold, <laughs> yeah, actually, so it didn't it didn't have any negative effect. No, you could keep yeah. going over that like effect, and yeah. Now the the one the one caveat, and this is because I've done you know clinical trials at this point, years of study on that, is um, you can tox out the system a little bit just by the lipid load, right? So your your liver and your kidney, I mean, they can only you're only going to be able to process out so much fatty acid combinations, right? Wouldn't so you then like have disaster so pants or something if you... Yeah, well, I mean. depending depending on the type, right? If <laughs> yeah. you do it in, say, an MCT base or caprylic acid or capric acid or something like that, yeah, yeah, you're going to have some serious issues very rapidly. Like kind of the threshold is about it. For most people, unless they do a, a lot of MCT or like they're bulletproof coffee junkies like myself, they, yeah. you know, <laughs> you're probably going to have like one tablespoon is like your threshold. And beyond that point, bye-bye. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, but so you, you don't want to do too many lipids, but in terms of the actual C60 that's been lipolized, yeah, they didn't find a toxic threshold. They found exactly the opposite, that it actually benefited them, and they got this 90% extension of lifespan. And I, I saw the research and thought, huh, well, that's kind of interesting. So I got some P53 knockout mice, which are the P53 gene is your tumor suppressor gene. So with a P53 knockout, they've extracted the tumor suppressor gene, and then the, the, uh, the mice are born without that. Um, the progeny of, of the ones where they've extracted it. Um, and so I took those those mice and I did the whole cohort and I put them on carbon-60. And the reason I use those is because I was looking for anti-inflammatory responses and, mm -hmm. and they have a very defined mortality curve because they're, you know, that's what everybody uses for cancer research, right? So if you're an wow. oncology person, you're doing research with P53 knockouts. It's just the industry standard. So there are, you know, tens if not hundreds of thousands of these poor little critters that have you know, been sacrificed for the greater good of science. <laughs> Unless so the, you ask them, and I'm sure they'd be like, yeah, whatever, yeah. not the greater good. So the P53 knockout mice, the, everyone knows, like, they only live for, like, this. It's, like, kind of like textbook. They live for a year or whatever it is. It's yeah, you've got wild-type homozygous and heterozygous and very defined mortality curves for each of those three. And so I got the ones with the, you know, the... the the shortest lifespan I could so I could actually quantify it and say, you know, okay, what's going on here? What's the inflammatory response like? Because what I was looking for was ways to decrease systemic inflammatory responses. And also, there, I knew that there would be a, a correlate with longevity. I didn't think there would be as much. I thought that most likely the, uh, the study that they did in, in France was probably a bit anomalous. But then at the end of the experiment, um, my mice live 93% longer on average. <laughs> and I thought, okay, so a 3% variance between what's going on there and what I did in my lab, that's obviously not a coincidence. I mean, that's you know some strange statistical anomaly, just like randomly, it's just 3% apart. So obviously there was something there. So I kept working on it and I thought, okay, this is, you know, this is a good thing. So then I started looking at the the other effects. And P53s, they idiopathically develop tumors, right? So they yeah. have spontaneous tumor formation. Well, mine didn't, and that was one of the things that was very, very curious. And, and actually, wow. interestingly, a, um, a study just came out where they, they did the same sort of experiment, but they, uh, they found that it was creating tumors, which is very peculiar because the guys in France and myself didn't see any tumor formation, and I've used it um, on animals with cancer in the lab since then, and I know that it, it, it hasn't created tumor formation. So with that specific thing, because I'm sure somebody will ask about it, um, my guess is that it's very easy to have an experiment like that go awry because there's a, a definitive degradation and an oxidation of the, of the lipids if you expose it to light because C60 is mm -hmm. very photoreactive. It's very, very photoreactive. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, actually, that's why all the bottles are dark on the stuff I make and that kind of thing because you have to keep them, you know, in the dark. So, yeah, so 93% extension of lifespan – no discernible tumors, which kind of led me to item two on my list, which was cancer, because I wanted to see if I could make a dent in cancer. And lo and behold, you know, there was a thing there. So I, I took it a little farther and then actually made a, a special compound that was a, a lipofluorine saccharide conjugate, which is just a fancy way of saying fat, sugar, and carbon-60. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> The lipofullerene sounds so much better. Yeah, it yeah. does. Yeah, it's the yeah. There's the there's the fancy way of saying yeah. it, and then there's the, the normal. Yeah. yeah. 
And so I, yeah, I try and explain things. I, I was explaining some of this stuff to my dad one time and he called me out and he was like, dude, stop with the quarter words. Like if you can't explain it in plain English, then you don't really understand it and you're not as sharp as you think you are. So why don't you try again? And your dad is a smart guy. He's, yeah. Yes. My dad is like a super freak genius. Yeah. He's like literally probably one of the smartest guys in the world. He's got that, you know, super almost 200 IQ kind of thing going oh on. Oh, <laughs> frighteningly daunting when you're a little kid, right? Because that's just the norm. You don't know any difference. So yeah, yeah. I remember trying to read his uh, his master's thesis when I was a kid, and I had to get a thesaurus to go through the first paragraph, like quite <laughs> literally, <laughs> which which definitely puts things in perspective when you're a kid. You're like, oh, okay, so that's where the bar's at. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. This so. is what I have to live into. Live <laughs> yeah, up that's, to. That's, Jesus. That's exactly it, right? So yeah. like, wow, those, those shoes seem kind of large. So... <laughs> <laughs> so you start pushing yourself. Anyway, so it, with the C60 thing, that's uh, that's kind of where that came from is doing the research in that and just seeing what sort of things you could do with that and the different biological responses you could elicit. And, and it was it was crazy, right? So drops in cytokines, inflammatory responses, they would all just, you know, in two hours, cytokine responses would drop. Wow. And so that's, uh, yeah, I did that for quite a few years, filed a, a bunch of different patents, released a bunch of different products, and then uh, really stopped working full-time on that last year and started working on, oddly enough, pro-oxidative effects yeah. of things, which, you know, led into ozone, which which is all just a result of the, uh, the pandemic. Um, a friend of mine has a bunch of real estate in Austin, and we were discussing different things that we could do together. And at the time, he was trying to figure out how to sanitize his daycares, actually, in his office buildings. Yeah. And so we started talking about, well, we can do it with UVC and, you know, use UV lighting to crack viral load and, or viral bodies. And, and, uh, and that works like a champ. But the problem is, you know, when you're using light to do something, you don't get, uh, you know, 100% coverage because if the light doesn't hit it, it doesn't kill it. Yeah. And so then we, we kept bouncing ideas around and we came up with, you know, one of the things when you're looking at UVC, you, you ultimately will hit ozone because you produce ozone um, when you're making UV light at high intensity. There's it kicks off ozone in the air. And so we started talking about ozone and then we started talking about, you know, instead of doing ozone and spraying it in the space, uh, because it's really it's really bad to breathe ozone, hence ozone action days. However, yeah. if you use it in the right capacity, like if you do rectal insufflation or autohemotherapy where you pull your blood out and then you mix it with ozone gas and re-inject right. re it, that stuff is amazing, right? Like it's got all these tremendously beneficial biological effects. So we were noshing things around, and, and uh, he said, well, can we just do something so that we're basically doing autohemotherapy, which is like one pass of the 10 pass, right? If you're like familiar with the 10 pass ozone therapy, I know you are. Um, yeah, I interviewed, so for people that don't know, I interviewed Robert, Dr. Robert Rowan, yeah. who's a big ozone guy. And yeah. actually, when I went to see him, we got to put that video up. He, uh, he was injecting himself. He was doing his own 10 pass. Yeah. And so he was, and, you know, he was putting ozone into his bloodstream to get this, um, these downstream hermetic effects yeah. that ozone gives you. And maybe we should just go back really quick and just explain briefly what ozone is. Sure. And um, and then maybe why it's why it's beneficial. Okay, so chemically speaking, ozone is just basically O3, right? So normal air has O2 and it's it's stable. And O3 has one extra oxygen atom kicked off on the side of the molecule and it's very, very unstable. It wants to strip off electrons and, you know, so that's why it's pro-oxidative. Is effectively, when you oxidize something, the most common oxidation that everybody thinks about is rusting. Right? Yes. So yes. <laughs> your, your body is rusting, which is incidentally with the research I was doing with carbon-60, that's why it's so effective is because it's a tremendously strong antioxidant. But when you when you take it a step further, as I did when I started looking at the ozone, you actually have to balance out both sides of the wave, right? So you've got your antioxidant effects and your pro-oxidative effects, and you, you want to balance those. Like vitamin C, if you take it in a low concentration, is an, a, a good antioxidant. In fact, for the, for the auric scale for antioxidant load, vitamin C is kind of one of the standards. That's why you'll see research on carbon-60 where they're like, oh, it's 270 times stronger than vitamin C. Yeah. And, and that is accurate in a specific capacity. Incidentally, it actually can cycle multiple times. It's kind of like glutathione where you can reprocess it and yeah. reuse it. So it's actually multiples of that. But um, the vitamin C, when you pass a certain threshold, you know, generally about 10 grams, it ceases to be an antioxidant and your body upregulates things to become basically a pro-oxidative effect. Okay. And so ozone is 
a pro-oxidant. However, in, in the capacity in which, you know, I set it up here, um, it really triggers antioxidant behavior, right? So you, you hit, it's a hormetic stress response, right? So you give a little dose of something and your body responds and it gets stronger from the insult, right? So in this case, you have a pro-oxidative insult and because of that, your body goes, ah, I'm, I'm under assault. And so it mobilizes glutathione, superoxide dismutase too, and it, it elicits all of its own antioxidant protections to really come up and just fight this incredible oxidative assault. Yeah. And so, you know, because in reality, when you inject it in like a, you know, a 10 pass or just standard on hemotherapy, um, there's no ozone left it, because it's, it's about the third most reactive molecular species. So it, there are a hundred million interactions that occur in a second with ozone. I mean, it's very, very reactive because it's highly wow. unstable. So by the time, if you inject it in your blood, um, like when I do autohemotherapy, you know, I'll pull the blood out and, and then I inject the, the ozone into it and the color changes and then you reintroduce it in your blood. But after a couple of seconds, there's no ozone left. What you're left with is these signaling molecules called ozonides. Ah. And that's, that's actually kind of the, the special sauce. And it's, it's sort of reductionist to think that it's just ozone because everybody just calls it ozone. But in reality, there is no ozone at that point, right? If you're doing rectal mm. insufflation, there is ozone, but it, it's gone in a couple of seconds after it reacts with, you know, the, uh, the mucosal lining inside. You know, it just kind of goes away. And yeah. the same thing with 10-pass. It's all happening so rapidly that really what you're banking on, and this is why you get pronounced effects that last, you know, 24, 48 hours, uh, it, it's stabilized ozonides. And actually, mm. you know, guys like uh, Robert Rowan, Frank Schallenberger, they're kind of the, the, uh, the big heavyweights in the U.S. But really the best research I've seen on ozone comes out of Cuba, actually. Yeah. Well, actually, Robert Rowan always refers to Cuba. <laughs> Yeah, in Cuba, so they did all this research in Cuba, and they used ozonated oils as the backbone for a lot of their stuff. And when uh, when my friend and I were talking about you know how to how to do things for physiology to modify it and and try and kind of help people instead of spraying the space with ozone, actually just you know give people the equivalent of something that would do autohemotherapy, I didn't actually think it would be possible to really do that because I didn't think it would be strong enough. So, you know, but yeah, because of the gut and everything else, right? Breaking yeah. things down, like you're not going to get any, that's why people do the auto yeah, chemotherapy exactly. or the rectal because you're going to get such a yeah, huge there's boost, a big right? Pop, yeah, right, exactly. And, you know, there's a lot of molecular interaction and, and it's all about the quantity of it that you're doing and you have to really regulate that so you don't go overboard and damage your mucosal lining or anything like that. Real so, quick, what about the, I know there's like a company that makes an ozonide, um, ozone filter like it shoots out small particles of ozone that i assume are a lesser grade of ozone because obviously you're not breathing it in is not the best no, y yeah you don't want to breathe the stuff in but it, and that's supposed to help sanitize rooms they market themselves as yeah and it does it absolutely will kill a virus kill a bacteria it just eviscerates them i mean it breaks them down that's that's the beauty of ozone is that things don't really have much of a protection against something that's happening at an atomic level. <laughs> so if you're actually just ripping apart electrons, yeah, you can pretty much destroy and hence sanitize most things. Um, and that's what ozone does. It just rips through everything, right? Yeah, it's, destroys it's, everything, like the bad things, the viruses, bacterial, all that stuff. Yeah. And I know Robert Rowan did stuff with like Ebola, yeah. which where he's like, yeah, just totally yeah. wipe that out. Well, it, it cleaves the tail off the Ebola, right? So you can't can't replicate. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's brilliant. The problem there is it's super cheap. So, you know, there's probably not, there's probably not a uh, really great way for, you know, pharmaceutical companies to get a oh, right, big, big right, infusion right. of dinero uh, <laughs> by virtue of patenting something that's not really patentable, right? You, I don't think you can actually patent a molecular species. So not yet. luckily, yeah, <laughs> it's all right. Yeah. So it is, it's nature's uh, disinfectant and it's incredibly good, but I, Personally, I didn't really think we would be able to kind of pull it off in terms of being able to do something that would get the same sort of biological effects. Not to say that it's exactly the same, because I, at this point, don't think it's exactly the same. But it's 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 such a good approximation, and it's so much easier, right? Because I, I'm not a huge fan of going in and sitting down. I, I do it. I haven't actually done it since I've worked on the biocharge product, because... I don't really see the necessity. I would rather do one little capsule in the morning every day in lieu of going in, you know, every couple of weeks and pulling out blood because the or sticking a thing up your butt and having to do it, it right? Yeah, I have an ozone machine at home, and yeah, it's just it's so much easier to take I, a pill. Like, yeah, you know. it's so much easier. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think in terms of uh, marketing things, people like pills. They don't like uh, 
you know, suppositories. Yeah. It's uh, no, no, <laughs> it's, yeah, no. You know, when you go to the store, there's a lot of different sorts of candies because doing something orally is very simple and easy and not inconvenient. But there aren't a lot of sugar suppositories. It's just yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> 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 I haven't, haven't seen any. Maybe we should invent that. Just the the suppository candy store. Yeah. You know, yeah. maybe there's something there. Failed business ventures, right? Yeah, the Sherman Fire Extinguisher Company in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, I don't, you know, I just I don't interviewed James he Altucher. He's always talking about running the idea experiments, <laughs> the idea machine, and just testing and retesting. I mean, he he did a test of walking around pajamas all day. That didn't work out, but so maybe we should just test it <laughs> it's a, it's and see. A fantastic <laughs> idea. He was he wanted he he thought, hey, pajamas are comfortable. What if they could catch on that people would want to just wear pajamas as a clothing line? Well, obviously, he hasn't been to a Walmart in the Midwest. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think I that's think true. I can, He's in New York. I think I can. By the way, he said he did say, say the experiment failed. He's like, yeah, I, I chose not to. I chose not to go with that idea. Well, I can. I can say matter of factly, if you go into a, a Walmart in the Midwest, uh, where my lab's at. Uh, you will definitively see people walking around in pajamas in the middle of the day and at all hours. So he needs to target so, the right out. Okay. Yeah, he's there just, that's the thing. Right concept, wrong application. It's just the market. Yeah. He needs to dig deeper on the demographics, and then I'm sure it'll be aces. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the uh, the concept there is just it's, it's ease of use, right? And so initially I looked back at the research, and it turns out that uh, Nikola Tesla was the first guy to do ozonated oils. And... His process took eight weeks, and he had this, you know, crazy uh, magnetic field array where he had beds with magnetic fields beneath them, you know, coming up from coils, and he would fill it with olive oil, and then he would bubble ozone through it, and it changes viscosity and gets more solidified, and becomes more like a gel as you as you bubble the ozone through it because it does this long course redox reaction, and it's kind of like a triple pass. It reduces, and then reduces, and then reduces, and then it's finally stabilized. And so his process took eight weeks, and then I started looking at the stuff that was being done currently around the world. And, you know, the guys in Cuba, and then there's some places in the U.S. that were doing it, everybody's process took two and a half weeks. And with deference to Tesla, Tesla was a sharp cat. Right? Yeah. He was a really sharp yeah. cat. And I thought, well, okay, somebody that smart, he's not trying to burn cash and time. What was his impetus for doing this? And then it, it clicked that, because it's a polar molecule, it, it has an orientation, and he was basically setting everything up so that it lined up single file, so that per unit volume, you had these things that hadn't reacted yet, and they were stabilized, and so it had the net effect of being far, far stronger than anything that anybody else was doing. Mm -hmm. And he was the last person that did that. Nobody else that I'm aware of or could find anywhere had done that since, and I thought, oh my god, that's brilliant. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll copy that. So I did that, and and that was cool. But then I thought, well, you know, I mean, I've got like a hundred years of new toys and tech that he didn't have access to. I mean, yeah, you know, again with deference to Tesla, I mean, he envisioned a lot of things like lasers and all sorts of stuff, but the, the tech just literally wasn't there. But I had it, yeah. And so in my lab, I I put together all this kind of craziness and and started figuring out, okay, well how can I change the intensity of the molecular interaction? And so, you know, jokingly, it's kind of like it goes to 11. You know, it's <laughs> you, you get a certain interaction, but when you're looking at like, um, and, and again, you know, we, we've talked about this. I'm not a fan of using the term quantum in anything, but. But you did. But I did. <laughs> but and, you use it. But I did. But you did. Yeah, and it, it's because the other option was to have the very wordy little bitty packets of energy. Yeah, um, I'm glad you used quantum. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad the R&D people at your company were like, just say quantum. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, I, I, I kind of, I'm not, again, I'm not a big fan of it. I almost would like to pull it, but but it really is. I mean, that's effectively what it is. It, it's so you're, you're looking, because quantum, like quanta just means the smallest component of something that's measurable that's part of an interaction, right? That's that's all it is. And so the the particular quanta here is I was looking at the molecule and my thought was, well, how do you change the interaction of a molecule without changing the molecule, right? Yeah. Because in theory, that's not supposed to be a thing that you can really do, but that actually is, fate would have it, is wrong. Uh, and so <clears throat> when you look at, um, in 1924, when quantum physics was kind of really catching stride, one of the guys who worked out the wavelength equations was this fellow named Dubroy, and his his equation basically accounted for the the oomph in an atom or in a molecule in terms of its its wavelength of emissive wavelength um, by virtue of saying, okay, so we've got this atom, and 
it's one unit of energy and that's it, right? And so you, you just assume, and everybody has pretty much since then, that there's like you know, this very predefined thing based on the de Broglie equation and you can calculate how much energy is contained in it. Well, the idea, because they didn't at the time, didn't know that everything has spin, right? So now we know like mm. fermions and bosons, everything is rotating, right? It's either, you know, single or half integer spin. And they, when they looked at, you know, the confined energy in the system, they were just taking into account the fact that the electrons were rolling around, right? So the equivalent of a planet revolving around the sun. That's not actually the real big energy in the system, right? So the big energy in the system mm -hmm. is the, the rotation on the axis, right? Because you've got a huge amount of confined energy just by virtue of the planet rotating on its own axis because it's, the velocity is very high. Yeah. So my thought was, well, what if I can change that? Is there a way to entrain that and up that? And I had, I had seen th some things that I could not explain. And so I was really diligently trying to figure out what the hell, you know, like, why can I not figure, figure this out? And so what I came up with was, okay, well, I can entrain the electrons and get them by using resonance to up the energy level, like change the actual spin in the, in the energy in that confined system so that I'm not just dealing with, you know, the standard revolution around the nucleus, that I'm actually tweaking the spin and the velocity of the spin because that's, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with things that are moving that rapidly, there's a lot of confined energy. Yeah. And so I figured out a way to do that, and which is why it's quantum charged. And, and I do, I catch a lot of flack, especially from <laughs> friends, because I, I, am, I am the first one to say, yeah, I get it. I know it sounds wackadoo. And it's difficult because you can't, like I came up with a rig to test it because nothing existed to test it, right? So like, you know, nobody had looked at that before. So I was looking at, you know, like high frequency yield plasma discharge of things when they would interact. And that was how I figured out like, oh, okay, it's actually different. And then from the physical sense, the test that everybody's used to, you can do like dark field microscopy and look at the effect of the blood work and go, okay, well, this is what it does when you do this. And this is what it does when you do this. And you can look at that kind of stuff. And, and we're actually, we're doing some experiments like that now so that we can show people like, look, it's not just this, you know, kind of odd con conceptual sort of thing. There's, yeah. there is a practical yield here where you can look at this and say, oh, okay. So if I do this, I get this effect. And if I do this, I get this effect because the idea, I don't, you know, really think that you could take a normal, because I've done it, a normal cap with, you know, 300 migs of, you know, oil and actually get any real response. I mean, you can taste the ozone, but there's really not much of a pop. That's what I wanted to ask you, because there's people that make, like, ozone um, toothpaste and yeah. stuff, right? And so that was what I was going to say, exactly what you were – see, that's your intuition, man, <laughs> is, you know, how – okay, this is the quantum ozone that you, you're making – Versus me buying someone's olive oil based ozone, you mm -hmm. know, when you can taste the ozonides and stuff that are in there, yeah. you know, what would be the what would be the big difference? Because this is quantumly charged, it, right? And so, and again, I you know, I know that's kind of a hard pill to swallow. What it, what I would say is just you no know, pun intended. Yeah, truly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what I would say is test them side by side. You know, yeah. if you take a normal ozone cap, you'll maybe have like a, a burp where you taste ozone or something yeah. like that. Um, but you, you really don't feel much. And I, and I did a ton of this when I was researching this and putting it all together. You don't, you don't really feel it. Like, you know, it's beneficial because it's having an effect, but there's no real pronounced like, Ooh, you pop one of these things, you actually feel yourself get warm and, yeah. and it happens pretty much across the board. And the other thing, and this is kind of, kind of an ephemeral sort of things is people's, uh, deep sleep quality changes. Like everybody who tracks oh. their deep sleep with an aura ring, a lot of them have been, in fact, Everybody that I've talked to that tracks it with an aura ring has noted a pronounced shift in their deep sleep. And why why is that? Do you think is it just the the hermetic effect, and then the fact that free radicals are being destroyed in in some honestly and then there's some kind of upstream of downstream effect? I don't know yet. Yeah, you know that's uh, that's I have I have some ideas, but you know rather than postulate something that's you know completely wackadoo or not really accurate, I'll <laughs> I'll just stick to the science. Yeah. What I know is you can elicit a specific biological effect that's more pronounced because there's more of a molecular interaction, and and it is it's the the hormetic stress response, not not so much in terms of what it does for sleep, but just the reason you can tell a difference is I kind of equate it to Blitzkrieg, right? Like lightning warfare where. You know, they would play loud music and things on the, on the German planes um, because you've got a very small packet, but it has a very pronounced impact. So your body thinks there's been this 
very large oxidative assault, so it really mobilizes, you know, it's trying to hit it with equal force, right? So it mobilizes a tremendous amount of defenses to go against this pro-oxidative insult, when in fact there really hasn't been that much of an oxidative insult. So what you really get is this huge mobilization of all these beneficial antioxidants, which mm -hmm. goes back to kind of, you know, what I was doing with C60, where I was trying to get things that would line the mitochondria so that they would stabilize in the mitochondrial lining and act as an oxidative buffer. And then you have these sorts of things that are pro-oxidative that create this pro-oxidative insult because you're, you're sort of balancing out the energy curve, right? Yeah. So you get something to pop yourself up a little bit and you get something to buffer yourself down. And so you're, you're working on both sides of the curve and it has the effect, the net effect of increasing your energy. Like w when I would test ATP uh, levels just with C60 things, we would see a jump between 18 and 58.3% in ATP production. And wow. yeah, huge, huge pronounced change, but it's not because it's actually making more ATP. Literally all it's doing is it's allowing the, the electron transport chain to do its thing without getting negated by oxidative load that's being placed on the mitochondria. And so it's not Got actually it. adding anything in, it's just blocking system loss. But you know, I mean, when you're looking at the numbers of the readout and you look at, oh, this is what the change was in ATP, you don't generally think through it, but you know, I really wanted to understand, well, why is this doing what this is doing? And that's it, it's not actually adding, it's just stopping loss, you know? Not, not how much money you make, it's how much money you keep. <laughs> right, and right, it, yeah. And it's the same thing, it's not, you know, it's not how many electrons and protons you can move, it's how many you can move without having them go into a different reaction that's not gonna give you some sort of beneficial biological yield like more energy, you know, which is kind of what we're all after. Yeah. And that, and that you can quantify, like yeah, and more that, energy. Yeah, so it's like, yeah, that is that's why I'm taking this. Very quantifiable. Yeah. And well, and, and the, all the peripheral effects, just the, you can feel, you know, your mitochondria kick on. You feel this kind of wave of heat go through you and you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. And, and I did it as, you know, my own little sort of blind test in the lab with the, uh, the guys who work in my lab. Both of them, like that on the first round of testing, this was hilarious to me came in and tried to adjust the thermostat because they, Interesting. <laughs> they both thought it was it was getting strangely hot in the lab and it which cracked me up because I just you know, make a note. And you know, and other people too, that's that's the first thing they notice is they'll they'll take the capsule and then, you know, 10, 15 minutes later they just kinda hmm. and it and it's not something that's really top of mind because people don't really think about that sort of thing. You know? Yeah. Would you take this could you take this like pre workout, or, or would you recommend that? Or how and how would how would you recommend people actually take I, it dosage wise? I wouldn't recommend it pre workout. I don't think that would. Uh, I don't Eating think that would really. Yeah, I don't think that would jive because you you actually want to have some oxidation going on. So if you take something that triggers this hormetic response and you're going to flood yourself with antioxidants right before you work out, you're going to. Oh, and then I was thinking it was it's a because uh, I was thinking pro oxidant. But like you said, the body combats with antioxidant. Yeah, exactly. And, and, okay. Yeah. So that makes sense. If you did it, like if you did a hard workout and then you popped a capsule, that would help. Okay. Um, you know, and then because it would it would kind of time itself more with the body's natural cycle in terms of you know what you're doing when you actually tear the. the yeah, I want to try that. Yeah, yeah. That that would be a better timing thing. I mean, really, in terms of dosing, if you're you're trying to do something like if if you have candida. Yeah, I, was, uh, I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, it's, it's great. It'll just strip things like that out, but take it with food, right? And that's because your digestion kind of slows down and it'll keep it in your gut and then it'll open in your stomach and then it will actually have a direct effect. Um, normally, the, this is set up for a, a time, like a delayed release capsule. Um, and so it goes into the small intestine. And I always recommend that people take it in the morning before food. And that way it just goes all the way through, hits the small intestine, opens up, and then it perfuses more in the bloodstream, which is what I was really shooting for was to get that sort of systemic effect akin to the autohemotherapy. So for that purpose, yeah, definitely take it by itself. But if you have something specific like Giardia or Candida, they are actually trying to zap. Yeah. Pop them with food and, you know, and look up there. I think we have them on the, uh, the website for biocharge and you can find some of the studies, but also just, you know, Google the studies in Cuba because there's a litany of them. I mean, they really, very well defined science. They they did a fantastic job, actually. The the but even though the studies in Cuba, they're not quantumly charged, and I'm not being funny. No, they're, no, no. They're, they're but they're not. They're, they're not. just using the oil. The yeah, they're the just oil. using yeah. the oil. And that, okay. And so from from a practical sense for people who have an issue with the, the concept of quantumly charging something, which you know 
and, and I understand that it's kind of on the the uh, the periphery. It's on the woo woo, yeah. It well, it, it is, but you know, it, it's quantifiable, right? So I can quantify it. I mean, you can quantify it with a photonic effect, and so it's not so woo woo, right? But it's still, it's not mainstream, and until you know, science is generally a bit slow to adapt. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's kind of where I where I feel the most comfortable in the world in terms of the realms of science, but I. I try and take it with a more open-minded approach because I'm not trying to, you know, publish papers. I'm not trying to get tenure. So I don't, yeah. I, I effectively, I don't have as much to lose, right? If you, yeah. if you have to pick sides and try and bias things based on, you know, you've, you've got to toe the party line, it's a little bit more slow to, uh, to make progress because you can't be as intellectually curious and free, right? Because I, a lot of times, like with this, I really didn't know where it was going to take me. I started yeah. looking just in earnest because I was trying to answer a question, and it went down a very different path than I thought it would. You know, I really didn't think this would end up where it ended up. And it, as it stands, I love this stuff. I think it's cool. Yeah. Um, but that's because it was just, you know, pure intellectual curiosity. Well, okay, if this, then what? And because I don't have any particular ideological dogma about, you know, well, it can't be this because that – deviates from this you yeah. know, it was like looking at de Broglie's equations they were brilliant for 1924 but you know we have surpassed technologically the you know the constraints that were placed on those guys because we have better tech we have better instrumentation i mean you know look at gravity waves like you go to ligo i've been to ligo that place is amazing right and you know we're as technology progresses and theories progress we get all this new instrumentation and humanity it's funny because you know Chinese medicine, right? So they had acupuncture points and and uh, Ayurveda. They had Murma points and and you look at how that correlates um, to you know galvanic skin response and and stress responses. It's a perfect correlation, right? And now that yeah. we have instrumentation to measure it, lo and behold, wow, wow. The, those points actually do have an impact. There's something energetically happening at those points, which cracks me up because. It's been written down in, in those particular things for five and 6,000 years, respectively. And yeah. now that we have the data to be able to interpret from a machine that we've used to calibrate it, we say, oh, it's it's actually a thing. Thank you so much. It's okay. It's permissible now. But, you know, the traditional method, I think, as people, people that practice medicine and do things like that in the, the classical sense, like the, you know, the traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda, yeah. those guys, human bodies are really, in my opinion, a very amazing diagnostic tool. In fact, probably the most amazing diagnostic tool because, and this will seem a bit fringe, but my understanding at this point is that everyone is linked. You know, we just are. Yeah. We were and talking about that earlier yeah. about just being connected and this yeah. idea of oneness, right? Yeah. Everyone is linked and... That's just the way it is. And if you go from the, the standpoint of like looking at the many and the separate and the disparate, it, it's very difficult to actually make a dent because your, your fundamental thought process is erroneous. And, you know, you can't really expect to build something that's tremendously stable and something that's fundamentally flawed, right? The pressure will eventually break it and you'll have to go back and recalibrate everything and try and start over. And if you start from the standpoint of, okay, the presupposition here is that everything is connected and linked. Where does that mm -hmm. take me? You know, and with people who are doing that older types of medicine, they can do amazing things. And I've been to people that, you know, in, in, the, in the sense of classical science and Western science, it is inexplicable, right? The, it should not happen that way. Yeah. And yet it does. And it does over, over and, and over, over again. and over again. So, you know, not really being closed minded about it. I just go, okay. Well, it's obviously a thing. I don't understand it yet. There's some mechanism, and it may be that you know it's hundreds of years down the road before we we have the the technological capacity to identify it. It's there's a company uh, that I work with called Leela Q, and they have technology that's you know a quantum buffer for um, electro stress and magnetic stress and things like 5G. And on the surface, that sounds kind of woo woo, but the the lab data is from one of the top research institutions in the UK. And it's all blood work, right? Because they can't, mm. same th sort of thing, they can't directly test to see what the quantum effects of this type of shielding method are, but they can test the blood. And over the span of, say, five minutes, and, I, and I'll show you the images. I mean, if, if I'll talk to those guys and if I can get permission, you can just post the images. Yeah, because it, for sure. It, we'll it's, do a little overlay. Yeah, it's really intriguing to see, you know, because I have a couple of them because I, I on the scientific advisory board where 
you see a five minute interval and then a 15 minute interval and you look at the blood and it's literally, you know, they're exposed to say 5G from just a router mm -hmm. and then they put a jacket on that's quantumly engaged so it shields them. And then you look, they, same person, you draw their blood five minutes later and you do dark field microscopy on both. And if you look at the, the clumping and the adhesion and the cohesion of the blood, it's entirely different. And it's such wow. a pronounced effect that there's absolutely no way that that happens in and of its own accord. You know, unless they drank like, you know, two liters of water in between. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there are ways you could, you could tweak that data and cheat. But, you know, it, luckily I know these guys and that, that wasn't the intent. They were just trying to get good, pure data. But that too is a lot of, a lot of people who are kind of on the cutting edge of things are coming up with things that are quantum. And I think, it, you know, it uh, ultimately is right now it's a term that people are going to kind of mm, yeah. glaringly look at. and mm, But the reality is that's just where things are headed, right? And, yeah. you know, people have asked me recently, like, where do I think things are going? What excites me? Quantum biology excites me, right? The idea that things aren't happening from, you know, ionic interaction or, you know, ligands molecularly, that it's actually happening by frequencies and waves and modulations and interactions thereof. That's really where I think things are going. And as we, yeah. you know, and you can see it just in science overall, right? You look at things mechanistically like Newton, and then you start to refine things and go down to like Einstein and Bohr, and then you get, you know, more refined. And it's not that the things that predated that were wrong. It's just that they weren't the, the complete picture. And, yeah, they weren't know, fully developed, right? No, that's the thing. And, and science, is, science is one of those things that's consistently in flux, right? You can only look at it through the, the lens temporally where you're at, right? So we're in 2021, so we look at science as this lens right through. Right now. Yeah. It's very narrow. Yeah. Right. I guarantee you, I would bet my life that, you know, a thousand years from now, assuming we are, you know, all still here as a species, people will look at things and – probably laugh at what we consider just resolute absolute fact that we were so yeah. we were so convinced that that's how it was <laughs> right. right well and it's the prevailing idea of the day right you know the world is no longer flat and to us it seems well at least for some people but you know to us that seems kind of a silly construct but 400 years ago oh you know even despite evidence to the contrary that that was the fringe, right? Yeah. And then the fringe became the adopted methodology that was sort of more centrist in the norm. And then then it passed that point, and it was just well, everyone knows that, you know, right? And right. and that's that's how that's how it works for all. Meanwhile, these they didn't they like throw Gal didn't they like yeah get Galileo in a yeah Galileo know? Galileo was like yeah pen get out of here. house arrest <laughs> right. and, yeah <laughs> you can't say things like that. And now we laugh at that. We're like, no, that's how it always was. Well, and and the unfortunate bit is, you know, science these days. Um, is is a religion i mean yeah. it really is it's a and it's becoming one of those things that i i worry about the progress that we can all make as a species because things become so political and biased and you know specifically with the reference frame of what is this going to mean culturally well you know it doesn't really matter in a lot of cases the cultural implications shouldn't be really addressed you should look at the technology and what is it what is the data really telling you you know just honestly without bias, look at it and see where it leads you. Yeah. And, you know, and then it ceases to be so much of a, of a religious experience. And ultimately, I think it'll probably become, <laughs> if you're going to kind of look at it in that reference frame, it would become more of a spiritual thing where it, it has to do with what does it really say? What is the fundamental essence of, you know, science and where it's moving as a whole? Not so much where do I need to collect my next paycheck? And right, what, so, what, I can get, so I can get published right, or yeah, get funding for the next thing. Is going to thing? rebuff my submission? Yeah. yeah. For, so just real quick to tie kind of a bow on biocharge, this amazing product that you've built. A um, couple of things I want to ask: mm -hmm. if you're doing, if you do have candida or something, um, how long should someone take it? I mean, I mean, obviously you're not a doctor or anything, but do you, would you recommend? Because I know, don't my, even play one on TV. Yeah, thank God. <laughs> um, but you do play a scientist, <laughs> a quantum scientist. Um, because like my son had candida, and we were talking about that, and I gave him a, a pill. He's seven, and I gave him a pill, and he took it like a champ. Actually, one day he had like some stomach issues. I was like, "Hey, take one of these." Took it. He said, "felt He felt fine. He felt great." Now, I know you recommend like taking one. I think as an adult, I've taken a. I I text you that one day, and I'm like, "Can I take more? I'm not feeling enough yet. I don't feel enough of that." And you're like, "Uh, you. I think I, can't, I think you said you could. I wouldn't recommend." And I <laughs> by that time I had already taken two. Yeah. So I, nothing happened. I felt great. Yeah. Well, and yeah. I uh, I had always recommended taking one, but when I I got COVID right before my daughter tested positive uh, New Year's Eve, which was 
fantastic. Fantastic. And, yeah. and so, and then the next day, I, I was going into the kitchen and I opened the bottle and I couldn't smell any ozone. And I thought, hmm, that seems somewhat strange. <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe it's just the most perfectly packed and encapsulated bottle ever. And I, you know, realizing that that's totally a joke, I, I cracked the capsule open and put it in my nose and could smell nothing because my sense of smell was gone. And so I thought, okay, well, I have the tools at my disposal. So I started taking two capsules every morning. And, and that, was, that was actually handy. I'm not recommending that anybody else do that, but it made a difference. And I've seen a bunch of comments on our website that people were having good effects from that kind of stuff. Just on that note, can you talk about that? Because, uh, you know, everyone knows that there's a lot more data now on, on COVID and we understand like people are dying because there's a cytokine storm right. taking over the body. This could in sense nullify that or at least help. Actually, no, okay. So to, to break it down a little bit for a cytokine storm, no cytokine storm. Uh, I would recommend carbon 60 oh. or doing high dose vitamin C because both have a really pronounced antioxidant effect. High um, dose meaning what? 10 grams? Sub 10 grams. You don't sub. want a pro-oxidative effect, but, you know, maybe five like four, I think four, some people say five, five grams, grams yeah. every couple hours right. or four, every four hours. Yeah, and, yeah. and you'll hit a threshold, right? You're, you have a biological threshold for vitamin C, at which point you can no longer take more. Yeah. Um, I might just start, yeah. Yeah. Disaster pants. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, so I would recommend doing something that's very heavily antioxidative. Um, it, carbon-60, actually, when I did clinical trials on animals, we, we noted a, in two hours – tremendous drop in cytokine response like mm. it just absolutely squelched you know and i think i tested for 13 different cytokines so it, it dropped all the pro-inflammatory cytokines and elevated all the anti-inflammatory cytokines um which was kind of a cool effect so for something like that that's what i would personally do uh however if you're not in the uh in in the realm of having like some huge cytokine storm because that's that's more of a a very unfortunately sort of terminal effect where you're having a massive cytokine storm yeah I would uh, I would do this, I, and it is in fact what I actually did do is just take two of those in the morning, and try and kind of squelch the viral load a bit. Be, because what happens is the upregulation in your mitochondria, um, you get more of an energy boost. And I would postulate, and this is you know just based on having having had COVID twice at this yeah. point. <laughs> so and having had let's make damage. it three times. <laughs> Yeah, let's yeah. not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and uh, having, you know, I had to have exosomes injected uh, because my heart had so much damage to it. So it was like myocarditis and caused a dysregulation of my cardiac tissue. It was mm. not not terribly fun. Um, but having had experience in it at this point, um, what I would say is probably would focus on doing, again, just, just me personally, more of – more of the resistor a couple times in the morning because it, it actually made a difference. I could feel a difference with that. The C60, it, I wasn't having some massive cytokine response and I have access to all of it. And I took that and I didn't really notice that much. So I would try and suppress the viral load a little bit uh, in lieu of just trying to keep, you know, keep oxidative effects at, at bay because you're worried about a cytokine storm. I don't think it's terribly relevant. Okay. Um, and, the other thing, and this is from having gone to have it diagnosed for my myocarditis, uh, I would postulate, as I was saying, for COVID that there's a correlation between mitochondrial density and the effects of COVID. And if you look at if you look at a virus that's happening in a flying mammal, flying mammals have an incredibly high mitochondrial density. And uh, the areas, you know, because I'm on one of the COVID long haul sites, um, the areas that people are having problems are heart, brain, eyes, and f women a lot of times are having hormonal imbalances and things like that. And if you look at the points of highest mitochondrial density, it's an odd thing, but it sort of correlates, right? So yeah. you've got 5,000 or so per cell in your heart, uh, and then next is your brain and then your eyes for a guy. And then for a woman, it would be ovaries, and then heart, then brain, then eyes. And if you look at the the results that people are talking about that are the, the symptoms that they're having uh, post-COVID on these long-haul sites, man, they're really rough, you know, like hair loss because of hormonal dysregulation and cardiac issues. There was a study that came out of Germany where it, the cohort was about 100 people, and 86 of them had issues with their heart, even if they hadn't presented. And a lot of them had markers that were akin to having had a heart attack. Wow. Yeah, and, you know, it doesn't take, you know, too much insight to go, ah, well, you know, walks like a duck and quacks like a duck. And all these things are occurring in places that are mitochondrially mediated. So 
it seems reasonable to say that. And, and I know for myself, I went to um, a doctor who's a, a diagnostician, and, and he's an MD diagnostician in L.A., and when I wasn't having good results at the doctor I went to uh, in Oklahoma, um, I went out to L.A. because he's you know, a very world-renowned guy, and he ran diagnostics on me and said, oh, well, you don't have any active antibodies, you don't have any active virus, but then he tested my heart, and he said that it was actually inside the mitochondria in the cardiac tissue, which concerns me because if you think about it hmm. in terms of other viruses, it, um, you know, when you think about virology, everybody just kind of assumes that, you know, like, uh, say, like herpes simplex 2 or something, like, it's hiding in your basal nerve ganglia. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah, maybe, but maybe it's it's in that position, but it also could be intramitochondrially loaded, you know, and in situ there. And that's something that concerns me because you can have things that are just hiding out, you know, maybe in a dormant fashion, maybe just waiting, maybe like Hashimoto's, right? You know, maybe it's because Hashimoto's is interesting because you've got, you know, a syndrome and it triggers. And if you talk to people or read, you know, like Isabella Wentz's stuff, yeah. it always occurs when people have multiple stress loads coming on, whether right. it's physical, emotional, environmental, you know, chemical, whatever. Yep. There's always some sort of loading of the system at which point those viruses pop up. And it's just like a, a varicella zoster for shingles, right? Kids get it with chicken pox, and then it just goes dormant for ages. And then when people present with shingles, it's always after they've been exposed to some sort of external stressor. Stressor, right. Yeah. Again, whether it's, you know, well, and not necessarily external. It could be intrinsic. I mean, it could just be having a very stressful day. But, but, but that's the trigger, right? And so I think of things in perhaps a different sense and say, well, if it's on board, holding in the system, waiting for an opportunistic moment to just present, then one of those triggers could just set it up as a cascade. And, and it does concern me because when yeah. I see all these things that are functioning as, uh, you know, or, or associated to, not functioning as, but associated to places of high mitochondrial density, it just concerns me, which is, I think, actually why I, when I had it, I felt such a good effect when I was taking two of the caps because, you know, I'm upregulating my mitochondrial function and I felt better. Yeah, and it and it was palpable. Um, the unfortunate part is I don't think it gets rid of it, and I don't think it cures it by any means. And I, uh, I, I actually that's my kind of lamentation over the whole vaccine bit is I worry that um, even though it's a good thing to have those out, I don't know that it's ultimately truly knocking them out. I'm I'm con concerned that there's some sort of persistence to the viral load that we're not yet aware of. Yeah, because it's too new. Nobody really knows, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, from the time the first people had chicken pox that we're aware of to when somebody presented with shingles and, and made the, the correlation like, oh, you got this varicella zoster, and then it presents as this. The, the thing that's a, a total bear there is the passage of time, right? So mm -hmm. it could be that another 30, 40 years from now, we have an outbreak of some new novel condition, and then people go back and go, oh, well, you look at that. It, it's it's SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. You know? Yeah, there's so much. There's there's some people I've been following about this this whole the whole virology that mm -hmm. you brought up, and then there's this idea that we have a virome the way like we have a microbiome. Mm -hmm. It, it kind of seems like these viruses are actually just a part of us. Oh yeah, hundred um, percent. That is absolutely a fact. And, and so sometimes where I get confused too is, you know, you talk about like Dr. Robert Rowan for example in ozone, give yourself give ozone to kill the virus, right? You're killing the virus. That's the way we we think about it. But in my head, you're not really killing this virus. It's always going to be around, in a sense. The virus is not going to die, in a sense, right? Or am I wrong? No, no. It, and you're not it, able to get complete. Like when you give ozone, right? Whether you do it, you know, rectal insufflation or whatever, it doesn't matter what modality. You are not, and I can say this pretty, pretty clearly at this point, you are not going to get 100% perfusion through the entire body, right? You're not going to get it everywhere. It's not going to go all the way to your brain and, and perfectly distribute through every cell in your body. Yeah. There, just because of the rates of dissipation and interaction of the molecules and things like blood flow inside your bones, right? You know, it's an osseous material. It's not going to get there at the same rate of perfusion that it goes to your lungs and to your, you know, your heart. It just doesn't have the flow. Yeah. And so those things will be spent. So in, in terms of something that wants to hide out, it, well, it's still going to be persistent. And, yeah. you know, the thing with a virus that's interesting is if you have one, you know, it's kind of like a, a cancer cell, right? It just takes one. 
and then you know it can propagate. It may not do it now. It may just lay dormant for a while. But you know because it's like cancer. You know we have tons of those cells every day. We just keep them at bay. Yeah. You know until the point we don't, and and then it becomes problematic. So yeah, I I agree. I don't I don't think it's gonna entirely wipe anything out because the virus is still gonna have some stalwart of a load somewhere in there in your body. Yeah. And he kind of explained it's like a cookie jar, like the putting the lid on the cookie. It just takes off that lid so that the virus can't continue to like replicate and and do its thing. Yeah, so and with a specific concern like that, yeah, because that's you know a, that's a you know a hemorrhagic virus and it's going to be located in your blood for the most part, right? So initially, and so if you attack it in the bloodstream, you're going to be golden. Um, I don't know because I'm not a virologist. I I don't know enough to really definitively say. It will do X, but just being a logical person, you can go, yeah, you're not going to get 100% perfusion and be able to completely wipe something out. There is going to be a component that's left over. Yeah. You know, like with cancer, which I have spent a, a you know fair degree of time researching for the stuff I was doing to you know work on cancer for animals with C60, um, I can definitively say that you're not going to be able to get all those things out if you do you know some sort of resection um you know surgically just because it's kind of like if you filled a house with bbs and said okay we're going to bring in a backhoe get out all of the bbs <laughs> the scale is just inappropriate you know you'd have to knock down the house and you know do which effectively you can do like a radical mastectomy or something like that <laughs> probably not the best approach you know you need to look at something that is in an appropriate scale to have a, a well-balanced, measured response. And you, you just can't do that if you're trying to surgically deal with something that's at a, you know, a microscopic level. Not going to happen. Yeah. Um, amazing. I want to just kind of switch gears. Uh, any any other projects that you're working on that you can talk about? you got a lot of stuff going on, <laughs> so I don't want to say whatever you feel comfortable saying, but anything else that uh, you'd like to kind of let everybody know that you're also doing? Um, well, yeah, there's some there's some fun projects that I've got. The, there's the you know, the carbon negative concrete. I'm really jazzed about that because I think that'll actually have an impact. I think that's... Hey, you want to talk about that? Yeah, it's... Um, okay, so <laughs> normally normally in the world, you know, concrete is the number one building material in the world. And every year it pumps out, it accounts for about 8% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. And so what I did is I came up with a, a system where it basically it knocks out the 8% that would be produced and then it sequesters another 24%. So if everybody switched to this ubiquitously, which I don't expect will happen, no. but it, but if it did, it would take out about 32% of the global greenhouse gas emissions would be fan freaking tastic. I would yeah. love that because that too was on my board as one of the things I wanted to knock out. Um so that's that's a pretty groovy groovy thing and I it's it's definitely catching traction. I think um when people see it and they realize, oh, so we can be, you know, stronger, more effective environmentally to our benefit. Yeah, people and, love that. Yeah, and and then the cost is really, you know, not not much more expensive. It's just a, you know, modulating how you're doing things just a little bit. Um, and the guys who are actually doing the work, they will literally know no difference. I mean, it just comes out of a truck the same way. Yeah. Uh, that's impactful. So that that's excites huge. me. Yeah. yeah. That, that one excites me. And then there's some stuff that I've been working on for. Uh, a little more fringy stuff um, in terms of uh, like quantum shielding for uh, gamma rays and and that and that true it's actually it's um, using I, I've shown you the the patent on that so it's using some different techniques that are that have been around forever but it's just you know uh, differently using you know some fundamental physics principles uh, and tweaking them in a way that to my way of thinking, is a little bit more elegant than they've been used before. And then some propulsion systems, and uh, that I'm kind of jazzed about. There's some uh, working on some propulsion systems for satellites, and that's that's. You're taking cool. us to the moon, Ian? <laughs> I would love to <laughs> do you that. You and Elon? <laughs> I, would, I would love to do that. Uh, I think that I think that would actually be great, because the idea of strapping yourself to a bottle rocket seems <laughs> very poorly thought out to me. <laughs> So, well, you know, I mean, seriously, man, I mean, Werner von Braun did that stuff like, you know, over 100 years ago just about. And it, it's just, that's silly, right? Yeah. Why would you use propellant-based systems like that when there's so much better ways to do it? But I'm sure it's, you know, economics. And, again, things are slow to change. So, yeah, if I have my druthers, yes, that will be something that uh, I initially I think I'm going to do things with satellite propulsion systems just because there's so many satellites up now and a lot of them don't have – the ability because if they if you wanted to get telemetry on those things and, and move them 
you'd have to have at this point, you know, some solid or liquid propellant system. And the problem with propellants is once they're spent, they're spent. You know, so it's kind of like a, a one a one shot use for a lot of the uh, cube sats and things that have a specific purpose. And in this case, it wouldn't be a one time use. You'd just you know link up this propulsion system to them and then put a very tiny solar array. Because I've been working on a cube sat system, you just put a very small tiny array for photovoltaics on the front of that, and then you set the programming that. When it hits a critical level in the battery, it just reorients its telemetry so that its next cycle around, it catches sunlight, and then it's juiced up so that it can go and do its gig on its next pass. And so that kind of stuff, I, I think that'll actually have uh, some profound impacts because my guess is it'll probably go out for satellites first and then, you know, based on the, the uh, performance curve, which is a little better than, you know, because ionization propulsion is not new people have worked on it for a long time i just think this is with with everything better. you've been doing i've noticed a trend for you a lot of the stuff's not new no but you've really you have such an open mind to be able to look at it in just a different way yeah. and really elevate whatever's been done and i find that just fascinating with with everything you've done so thank you yeah <laughs> no i that's it, it's fun for me man i i can't believe that I actually get paid to do all this cool stuff all the time. It's, it's honestly, it's phenomenal. And when I, when I was a kid, my dad had this uh, show that he had me watch, and and I got completely hooked on it. It was this show called Connections. Mm -hmm. and it was by a, a British journalist named James Burke, and I think it was really instrumental because it, what it would basically do is it would take one concept and then it would go back to where that concept started. And the thing that really became um, very obvious to me was that no one person was developing these things from scratch. Like they didn't just show up and go, and right. here's a computer, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, there's so many disparate parts that have to come together for real innovation to occur Yeah, that you have these really brilliant people on all these different parts and they would take one concept and then somebody else would go, Hey, wait a second, I can add this to this concept or Hey, wait a second, I'm going to do this. Like I was working on a carbon arc, right? And I was trying to crack a puzzle, and then it dawned on me. I was like, wait, what What am I doing? The automotive industry has done this very thing. So I just looked at how an engine block was being modulated for the specific component I was trying to work yeah. on. And lo and behold, you know, Henry Ford had worked out those problems for me, you know, a <laughs> long time ago. Yeah. And then I just adapted that. And it's, it's funny, but um, a lot of it reminds me of jazz, right? So I studied jazz, and one of my things was – I like when, when you have a structure, which is kind of like a concept, and then you improvise, right? So you, you figure out the basics, and you, you have a working knowledge of how the structure moves, and then you try and find the most elegant resolution where you can get it to move and express what you're trying to do, and then you bring it back to some point of finality and conclusion in the most elegant way possible. And that's, you know, when you hear a, a really brilliant solo, that's what it is, is somebody is taking you on kind of a trip using their intrinsic knowledge to express themselves in a particular mm. medium, yeah. in, in that case, music. Uh, but the same thing applies not just to music, but all of these other endeavors, whether it's you know chemistry, biochemistry, physics, whatever. It's, uh, it's just a matter of like putting your own spin on it. Yeah, because I, I love doing this, and I, I think that down the road, hopefully – you know, some of the things that I've done seem to be really cutting edge now, but I know that, you know, 50 years from now, this this will seem old hat, and other people will come in and add to it and yeah. change it and hopefully take it to its, you know, its ultimate conclusion where it's some really beneficial technology. And that's that's what excites me is because I don't look at this as, like, we're just the, the leading edge of the wing right now, but we won't be forever. I mean, we're just setting it up for the next group to come in and, and do that, you know. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. Um. You ready to jump into some lightning round questions? Yeah, hit it. All right, let's do it. If the old you could see the new you, what would the new you say? No fucking way. <laughs> I love that, man. That's yeah. so great. Uh, because I get to work <laughs> on all of the things I want to work on. It, it's honestly, it's it's just a dream, man. I, I love it. Yeah. I. Yeah, I would have a hard time believing that there, there is a way to go out and do all the things that you're passionate about and help people and change things and catch traction with it. But th there's so many people out there who are really diligently working at making a difference that if you, if you have the right mindset and you're working earnestly and you're really trying to contribute and you're willing to put in the effort, they'll get your back. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, yeah, I think that's, 
<laughs> it would be hard for me to believe that things would be this good, especially, you know, because the trajectory I took a lot of times, like in, in 2008, uh, it was because something seemingly really bad had gone down. Yeah. And, oh, my God, best thing ever. Like, totally. Best thing ever. You know, and if I had been really downtrodden about it, uh, as opposed to just, like, hopping back on the pony and trying to recover, probably would have never done anything. And it, that actually, that's a big lesson for me is that just just because things go down in, in a way, it's your interpretation doesn't have to be like, oh, you know, so doom yeah. and gloom about things is because you never really know, right? It, it has the, the appearance of being one thing when, in fact, it's, you know, it's nature's course correction right <laughs> there was all it was meant to be um, really yeah i yeah. mean you know like oh well that's great and all but you really should be Blank. moving right that here. way this is where we need you yeah. yeah i was gonna ask you you know and maybe that you just answered it but i was gonna ask you what are some choices you think you made that made you who you are today um but that might meditation no. yeah having massive headaches when i was a little kid that actually was very formative because i they could find nothing wrong it just uh, biologically with doing, you know, CAT scans and tests. And um, so on a whim, uh, I, my dad recommended that I do biofeedback therapy. And, the, you know, back then the doctor was like, well, that's new and different because it was, you know, in the 70s and early 80s. And so I started doing real heavy-duty biofeedback training. And I think it was actually pretty formative in terms of just um, how my mind functioned. And from doing the heavy biofeedback, then I started doing meditation and and did a lot of meditation, and then the meditation led onto other things. And, you know, in terms of your capacity mentally, I know that mine has changed because I was, I was a bright kid, but I can do things now that, again, like if you asked younger me, I would be inherently jealous of because I wouldn't think that I could do <laughs> those sorts of things, you know, yeah. like put a bunch of credit cards on a table and just see all the numbers and remember all the numbers in whatever order and, you know, things that – the, the capacity has changed. Yeah. And so I feel like I've got better tools in the toolkit to play with. And I'm using them in an appropriate way, I think, you know, because a lot of the stuff that I'm working on is just stuff that I, I really want to make a dent and try and help people. So I kind of feel like if, you're, if your ethics are lining up with what your mindset is, then you have a little bit more oomph. It's coherence, right? Yeah. And, you know, in terms of the early meditation, I when I got the, the HRV tester, the little, uh, you know, for the Heart Math Institute – and I remember I got it a couple of years back and I clipped it on and I was going to test for coherence and I hadn't used it before. And I figured, oh, you know, I probably won't be very coherent. Everything was like entirely coherent. And I, and I remember thinking, oh, this is a joke. God, this is, you know, it's just giving me the score. So I yeah. had one of my kids do it. <laughs> and it just like, loser. <laughs> no, <I'm> just <laughs> cratered. And I, and I yeah. remember thinking, oh, well, huh. Maybe there was something to all that, you know, and I think mm. spending a lot of time, um, you know, meditating and doing like lately I've been doing um, Barry Morgan and stuff, Dr. B, the, yeah. the energy for success. And so I do, you know, energy work and practices, which, you know, energy work sounds kind of frou-frou, but basically it's, you know, you're trying to harmonize yourself is mm. really what it seems like. And, and you like any other system, right, the difference between a light bulb and a laser, one will heat a hot dog and one will punch a hole through steel and you can have the same unit count of photons. It's yeah. all coherence, right? If you have everything moving in the same direction at the same time, then you can do these amazing things. And, and I think that's what a lot of those practices, you know, whether it's meditation and you're looking for hemispherical coherence between the sides of your brain, when you start to elicit those states, you do have more tools in the toolkit, right? Like if you look at an MRI of someone's brain, you generally don't light up that much of your cortex, but if you're doing deep states of meditation, you can light up over 80% of your cortex. The only mm -hmm. other time that will normally happen with people is if they have an orgasm that lasts more than three minutes. And Whoa. biologically, I'm not really wired for that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I need as, that. as I don't think I most guys are, in yeah, my life. Oh. I'm a Taoist master. Yeah. You know, I know there are some guys that do that kind of stuff. Yeah. I am I am not one of them. So it's a whole lot easier for me to just go sit in a chair with my legs crossed uh, <laughs> than it is to embark on, you know, becoming some sort of, you know, master of some other you know, esoteric art, I'm probably not going to go down that very path. I think I'd rather just close my eyes and meditate a bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but the, the resulting effect of that is, at least in my personal experience, when I think when you stimulate that much of your brain all the time, some parts of it must be persistent because it, it my own experience, and granted this is entirely subjective, is that your capacity enhances and enhances and enhances and enhances mm. until you're 
generally locked parts of your subconscious become conscious, you know, and you and you actually gain conscious control. Yeah. Because under hypnosis, people can remember just a litany of stuff. Like you can ask somebody like, oh, what did everybody in your third grade class wear? And if they're under hypnosis, they can actually access that and tell you. But mm -hmm. consciously, you don't generally have access to it. And I think that over time, when you do deeper meditative states and you're stimulating that much of your brain all the time, you slowly start to get a little bit more access until eventually you just have very, very good recall. And, yeah. and, wow. it, and it, it's a, it's just an additional tool in the toolkit. I love that. Um, I'm a big reader. Is there like a one to three books that just jump out at you that had a huge impact <laughs> in your life that you would recommend <laughs> other people read? Yeah, there's uh the Razor's Edge by W. Somerset Maugham. That's a big one. Um, fiction book, but the, the message inherent there was great. And then uh, The Universal One uh, by Walter mm -hmm. Russell, which I actually carry when I travel because I, I still, to date, do not understand all of it. I'm working my way through it, and uh, I feel kind of like a, a monkey with a sack of hammers often <laughs> because I, don't, I know they do something, but I don't know exactly what. And, uh, and a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the stuff there is just absolutely brilliant. Anybody who's never looked at Walter Russell, I would, I would recommend that they check him out. You know, he was an architect, math, math, mathematician, scientist, musician uh, around the turn of the last century and just truly a brilliant polymath. I mean, everything the guy did, he was – almost obnoxious in the sense that it's so good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, some of the skyscrapers in New York were his architecture. Um, mm. There's, you know, sculptures all over the world that were his. He was the presidential portrait painter you know, or portrait artist. Um, and, it, yeah, it's just amazing when you look at somebody who's operating at a world-class level across so many disparate domains. It's... It, it's inspiring to me. Actually, yeah, that's that's, that's so kind cool. of yeah. That's I, those books are great, especially that one because uh, that's sort of my jam. Is I, I really want to, I want to be operating at a peak level across a whole host of different domains that excite me and interest me. Well, clearly you're doing that. I'm I'm working at it, man. You're I, rocking uh, it. Yeah, I'm I'm having fun. So as as long as I'm able to continue doing this, <laughs> you know, as long as I don't come up with like, look, the Edsel. You know, I don't want <laughs> you know, because just statistically, I'm going to have some idea that I think is just the bomb that's going to be absolutely brain dead and not, not well thought out. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's probably going to happen at some point. But for right now, things seem to be cruising along pretty well. Well, I think you're doing fine as long as you don't invent pajama clothes. I think we're, we're going to be fine. <laughs> well, the testing on that will start in a Walmart <laughs> in uh, Oklahoma in a couple of days. So, um, Last question before we wrap things up. Uh, I want you to finish this sentence. Twenty, because twenty twenty destroyed a lot of people and just their mindset and everything. So I like to reframe it. Twenty twenty was the greatest gift because it allowed me the time to think. Mm. Yeah, there generally there's so many distractions. I mean, you've been around me, and you know my phone is constantly going off and buzzing yeah. and text messages and this and that. And twenty twenty was nice because uh, everyone was a little bit sequestered. Yeah. And that I think that afforded me the ability to, to spend a lot more time kind of by myself in my lab doing things than I would have otherwise had. And it was, it was actually, it was really great. I mean, mm -hmm. there, were, there were definitely some difficulties, and I, and I actually feel really bad for kids primarily. Yeah. Uh, just because I think, you know, who knew? Social mammals needed <laughs> society Connection and touching. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cultural interaction is important. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Shocking. Take a primate, and they actually uh. need other primates. Yeah, I, I feel bad about that. But, yeah, for me personally, uh, it was fantastic. You know, Love I just it. got to lock down and kind of, drill in on a lot of the concepts, which is why, you know, like if you look at my mind map of the things that I'm working on right now, it, it looks like some, you know, schizophrenic, you know, like I, it really does look like I should be trying to solve a murder mystery, like yeah. <laughs> taking a very shaking draw off a cigarette as I tremble, you know, late, <laughs> late at night with post-it notes all over the board. It's kind of the same thing, but it's, uh, yeah, it was, it was great. I mean, a little disparate, a little crazy, but really cool stuff. And I, and I wouldn't have been afforded that time yeah. otherwise. Love it, dude. Um, last but not least, where can people find you? Um, so you can uh, go probably the easiest place. You can go to biocharge.co, and then the guys all route things to me there. Um, or you can go to wizardsciences.com <laughs> for all of the, uh, the craziness that I'm doing in my own lab and what I'm working on, and you can hit me up there. And, Perfect. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Love it. 
Thanks, man. Thanks for being on the show. Dude, pleasure. And I, I'm so glad that I actually got to do this in person. It is fantastic to see another uh, happy, healthy human who's trying to make a difference. It's awesome. Likewise, man. So thank yeah. you. Love you, brother. Thank you. Love you, too.